Hello, my name's Mark O'Mara and I am an English teacher and I'm going to talk to you a bit about how you would do the context response for your Year 12 essay, particularly as it relates to the context of encountering conflict. But before I start, I want you to look at me and think cigarette packet because I want to put a big warning label on the front of this. The first warning label is you have an English teacher. If you are going into this exam you have an English teacher who you have spent a great deal of time with and I would encourage you in the final hours before the exam to go and spend some more time with them. I know that by and large, you know, I've been a year 12 English teacher you're sitting there, you're delighted every time a student comes to you, particularly if they want to kind of bounce around the ideas and develop a sophisticated response. So it's good that you're looking for stuff on the interwebs, but, um, but go and talk to that person. You've spent a lot of time with that person, and no matter what I say in the next 10 minutes, it's not a substitute for going and having a one-to-one, 10-minute, 30-minute, 60-minute conversation with that person who you've been working with all year. So, you know, this is not, this is like those life things, those, um, life jackets that says, you know, this is this will not save you from drowning. I will not save you from drowning, but I'm going to tell you what I know. So, first thing is, go and see your English teacher. Second thing is, I haven't taught English, Year 12 English for two years. I still teach English, but I haven't taught Year 12 for two years. I haven't taught Encountering Conflict for three years, and I haven't read The Quiet American, which is the text that I know some of you have been looking at, uh, in 20 years. I was not very much older than you when I read it. So, I'm not going to steer you wrong, but please don't look at this and think, man, this is the magic bullet, because this is not the magic bullet. This is just something else to add to what you know. So, first thing I want to say about the context response is this, is the context response is about you showing a sophisticated understanding of a particular set of ideas. And there are always, I think there's always, always more than one idea. And particularly when you're looking at encountering conflict, so you're encountering conflict, um, you might think, well, conflict's the key word here. It's all about conflict. But you know what? If they meant just conflict, they would have made the context conflict. So encountering is important as well, and sophisticated responses will realise this, and unsophisticated responses will just zero in on conflict and just go, oh yeah, I'm just talking about conflict. Okay, so here I am with a copy of The Quiet American. The point I want to make is that when you're writing your context response, you're not basically saying, I know this book inside out. This is not a text response and the point is not to show off how clever you are about this book. So it's good that you've read the book. If you've got time to read it again before the exam, that'd be good. But I would hope that you've got plenty of examples that you can draw on and you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to put that in my pocket and you don't have to worry about it too much. I in fact didn't even reread it prior to making this video. So. First thing is, you don't want to spend too much time talking about this text. You want to spend a lot of time exploring the concepts involved in the prompt. I call this spending time in concept land, and not very much time in text land. So, weaker responses, you'll have a student who spends a tiny little bit of time in concept land in their body paragraphs. You know, they'll spell out a concept, but they might only take 10 or 15 words, and then they'll describe a, something that happened from the book in great detail to show how well they know the book. Now really, all that matters is this tiny little bit up the top. That's what you're being asked to be expressive and to really investigate, and all of this is just backing it up. So really, you've actually written a paragraph about that long. What I said to my students when they were doing this is, I actually reckon you want to spend about 70% of your paragraph kicking around the idea that you're dealing with, and then back it up with evidence from the texts, not just from the Quiet American. You know, you might have studied Paradise Row as well, or there are other texts. You want to back it up from multiple texts, and where possible, you want to be backing it up from things that are happening in the world. You know, you should have been looking at the newspaper all year long, but if you haven't, you want to get a serious newspaper, and given that this is for the VCE, I'm talking about something like The Age or The Australian. You want to be reading the first three or four pages to get the domestic news, by which I mean the Australian news, and you want to be reading the world section. You want to be talking about how there's conflict over the carbon tax in Australia. You want to be able to talk about how there was the government shutdown and the debt limit fight in the United States. You want to be able to talk about how there's conflict and civil war in Syria. You want to be able to bring all of these things in as examples. Again, don't make it all of your paragraph, but when you do get to this um, backing up your concepts with these examples, you want to be able to show the person, gee, I've really thought about this. And I'm not just banging on about the text. So the very most important thing, and you could, you could turn the video off now, and this would be the very most important thing, is um, stay in concept land, spend very little time in example land. 
Okay, let's, well, we're going to have a look at last year's prompt. And last year's prompt is the experience of conflict changes people's priorities. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to come back to that and I'm going to kind of pull it apart and say how I might react to it. So, first thing is, I talked before about how it's encountering conflict. Let's talk about encountering. There are different ways that people encounter conflict. Some people are absolutely powerless and conflict just comes to them. You know, an example of this is Fuong, who I, I think it might be Fong or Fuong, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, from The Quiet American. You know what, conflict comes to her country. She doesn't have the means to leave her country. This is in fact how a great many people um, encounter conflict. Trouble comes to them. And they're not in a position to get themselves away from it, so they might make minor manoeuvring to try and survive it, but conflict comes to them. Um, some people go into war zones, they go into fights, you know, they go into politics, they pick arguments with people, they stir the pot. You know, there are people who encounter it by seeking conflict. You know, people, for all that Fowler in The Quiet American is kind of sitting outside of the process, he's still a journalist who went off to a troubled part of the world. That's actually a fairly risky endeavour. You know, he's not sitting at home having a cup of tea with his wife in England. You know, he is still putting himself in the arena of trouble. So um, there are grades of it. I mean, obviously, if you're going into a combat zone as a combatant, as a soldier or as a CIA agent or, you know, whatever it may be, that's seeking a different level of trouble. But some people put themselves in this situation. Some people find themselves in a conflict situation and they're reluctant. And this is a word I talked about in the other video. They don't want to get involved. They want a peaceful life. And this is very popular in, in fiction. You know, you see somebody who's a hero, but they don't want to get involved. They just kind of get drawn into it by circumstances. And their own moral compass tells them, I've got to do the right thing here. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that Thomas Fowler is a good example of this because I think that his moral compass tells him a number of fairly dodgy things. Uh, and there are people who outright provoke conflict. So this business over here about encountering, you know, there are a whole lot of different ways to encounter conflict. And you could pull apart a prompt um, that used a word like encountering or when people find conflict and say, well, you know, it, it finds some people. And here are the types of situations. And some people go out and they start conflicts. And you want to be able to talk about why people start conflicts. Like, you know, generally we start a conflict because we think we can win. Sometimes you just start a conflict just because you know it's coming and you may as well go out and meet the storm. But there's a whole lot of stuff you can do with encountering. Over here, talking about conflict themselves, you've got different levels of conflict. And I'm going to put them kind of in a ladder, but they could just as easily go across. You've got personal conflict and interpersonal conflict. You know, which boy gets the girl? And there's a bit of that in The Quiet American. And there's conflict between brothers and there's conflict between people at work and there's conflicts between friends and conflicts between enemies. Um, you know, there's all this stuff. And when I say personal, I really just mean it involves one person and another person. And sometimes it doesn't say very high stakes, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of, in some ways, it's everything in the world. There is a quote which I was um, thinking of as I was preparing for this video, and it says, um, all politics is local. And I think it was, I can't remember, it might have been Tom DeLay, but you can look it up. If you Google it, you'll find it. It was an American politician who said it, basically saying, all stuff is at a local level. I would actually say that all conflict is essentially at a local, at a personal level. You know, even when you've got drones flying over Pakistan, killing people from, you know, 10,000 feet, there is somebody sitting, um, you know, perhaps in the Situation Room in the White House saying, yes, we're going ahead with this. A person actually says, I am going to perpetuate this conflict. You know, we're not in Terminator here. Nobody flicked a switch and said, we're giving all the decisions to machines. It is still people who are driving conflict. They're making the choices all the way along. They might not be pulling the trigger, but they're making choices about when to step forward, when to back off, what to agree to, how long they're prepared to go on with this conflict for. So I think you could make a lot out of the personal level. Uh, another is the political level. And by political, we just talk about how we make decisions. That's what politics is. And yeah, I've had students say, oh, I'm not interested in politics. You know what? Politics is just the system we use to make decisions. That's what politics is. And it's voting and it's lobbying and it's changing public opinion. That's what politics is. And it's inherently a conflict situation because I want A and you want B and we both basically play the game and I'm trying to bring about one thing and you're trying to bring about another. And the reason that politics exists is because in lots of situations you can't have A and B. 
there's only enough resources for one of these things. So the conflict is over the resources. Which brings me to another type of conflict, which is economic. Economics is all about resources. You know, would we be better off spending our money on A or B? You know, I can only afford to see a movie. Should I go and see Gravity later in the week or should I go and see Thor? You know, which one am I likely to go and spend money on on a Blu-ray when it comes out? You know, that's the economics of it. How do I get my bang for my buck? But it's still a conflict. And it's also about, you know, um, power as well. And I'm going to come to power in a minute. Oh, and of course there's military conflict, which is the one that everybody thinks of. You know, and violence is a method of solving conflict. You know, sending soldiers out and people enacting, you know, violence on each other as a way of solving conflict. You know, I'm talking about murders and assaults and stuff and other such revolting concepts. These are also an arena of conflict. So you've got all kinds of level of conflict that you can talk about with people. And the last thing I want to talk about, and it isn't in either encountering or conflict, but it's about power. Now, I don't think all people are not equally powerful. Some people will tell you that they are. I just think that's absolute nonsense. I think it's very, very rare that you go into a conflict where A is as powerful as B. Um, if you're looking at The Quiet American, you know, Thomas Fowler has a certain amount of power because he's been in Vietnam for a couple of years. He knows the lie of the land. He's an older man. He's got resources. Pyle has a different sort of power. I don't know whether it's equal. He's younger, so he's got more energy. He's working for the US government, whereas Fowler is just working for a newspaper. But they've got different sorts of power. And Fowler's power is very obvious. You know, he's got the title. And Pyle's power is less obvious because he can't exactly go around telling everybody he's a CIA agent. And Fong, it's just how I'm going to pronounce that, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, but since you're writing an exam, it's not the end of the world. Fong really doesn't have very much power at all. Um, a gender, you know, she's a woman in a world that is substantially run by men and where things are substantially solved by violence, which is something that men have greater access to than women. She is younger. So she's 20 and Fowler's in his 50s. Um, but she also has power in that she's valuable. You know, she's valuable to these two men. But they can pick up and leave the Vietnam, and she can't readily. So this struggle between people, you know, when you've got the conflict between various groups in Syria, when you've got the conflict with the debt limit in the United States, one group is more powerful to, than another group. They can actually put a stop to things. And But sometimes the conflict is over who has the power, not as in who can get more power, but who thinks they've got more power. You know, in the United States, you've got the presidency on one hand and the Congress on the other. In fact, there's two parts of the Congress. There's the Senate up here and the um, House of Representatives down here. And all three of these people have power, but they're all working out who's got the most and who thinks has got the most. So that power dynamic is shifting. And a lot of times, conflict is just about working out what it is that you're doing with that power. So, I'm going to finish up by talking about last year's prompt. It is extremely unlikely that this will be this year's prompt, but I'm talking through it so you've got an example. Last year's prompt is the experience of conflict changes people's priorities. Your key terms there are, of course, conflict, which I've talked about quite a bit. The experience of it is basically going back to how you encounter it, what you go through when you encounter that conflict, you know, what you suffer, what you learn. But the other thing that you really need to define is what priorities means. What do we mean by somebody's priorities? And I think of priorities, and again, you're not looking for a dictionary definition, and that's fine because you don't have a dictionary with you. Priorities are about what you put first. You know, that if push comes to shove and you've got to save person A or person B, um, who are you going to save? Or who are you going to take with you out of the country? Or what are you prepared to do to achieve things? Because it's all very well to say, oh, well, I value both A and B. But in a conflict situation, you can be put in a situation where you say, which is more important to me, justice or my romantic relationships? You know, I might make a decision where I, in fact, say, you know what, justice has to take a backseat to romantic relationships because when push comes to shove, this comes to the top of the list. And also, I might say, you know what, my country has to be more important than my personal relationships, and lots of people make that decision. Much as that sounds crazy, that a lot of us think, no, I would never give up my family for, for my country. So students of mine from last year are off in the armed forces, and they are saying, I will give my welfare and my life because I value my country so highly. That's up my priority. I believe we're in a conflict, 
and I put my country first. And the other things are going to have to come second, third and fourth. And I think that conflict becomes a crucible of sorts. And you can look up what that means if you don't know. There is, in fact, a very famous play called The Crucible. I don't know if it's still in the curriculum. And when the heat is on, then you really have to sort out. I now have to make the choices between A and B. So I think that when you're going for a conflict prompt, be really clear about what it is that you're saying. Don't just play, oh, sometimes this and sometimes that, because the examiners are reading a lot of stuff. Come out and actually make a bold statement and say, you know, it changes people's priorities and they will mostly put personal ahead of national and political and then argue that. Of course, you're acknowledging that some people put political and national first, but you're going to kind of push the point that, you know what, when it all comes down to it, it's all about what you personally value. That's just where I'd come from it. Try not to write something kind of bland and generic because a lot of people will do that. You know, they'll say, oh, some conflict's personal and some of it's global and some of it's economic and military, and they'll just kind of do this very bit by bit thing. I wouldn't do that. Pick something strong. I'm not saying take a crazy position, but pick a strong position and argue that position. And I'm just finishing up now. Remember, concept land. Spend a long time in concept land, teasing it out. What do we mean by priorities? How do we show our priorities? Is it just what we think we value or is it how we act? You know, is it what we tell people and what we do? Um, spend a lot of time in concept land and then dip briefly into example land. And really sophisticated responses, because I know some of you are watching who will be writing really sophisticated responses. Concept, example, concept, example. Like you'll be churning through it. Let's really tease this concept out. And it's not just arguing about the meaning of the word. It's really getting into what I mean when I say my priorities are X, Y, and Z. How much do I really value these things? So I hope this has been some use to you. Good luck in your exam. Stay in concept land. Use good examples. Reread and review your text and good luck with your context response.